right, so we are back once again. It's Chance Bending. JD, how are you today? All is well, B. Smith. All is well, man. Getting ready. Do you have the ho- you have the holiday spirit? Man, the holiday spirit is alive and well, man. Yeah, there, there's rumors that you're you're working out with big NBA stars and making things happen today. Yeah, you know that's why I'm not sitting right next to you right now, but. I know. I'm there in spirit. I know. If our if our listeners can tell, JD is on the phone. This is a big experiment today, uh, but you know Jordan has important things to do, so so don't mind him. Uh, anyway, all right. So I'm really excited about this one. I know I say that every time, but this is a good one. We have Mark Lanau in the building. Mark, how are you today? Great. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So, Mark, uh, I like to put our our guests on the spot and just ask them very quickly two things first thing is what's the last song that you played in your spotify it was a christmas song it was like Uh, a a bing crosby christmas song for sure i don't know which one was it white christmas probably something like that (laughs) yeah Yeah, you're in the mood i am i'm definitely in the mood man have you have you got your shopping done completely thank you yeah thank you amazon Uh, so, so for for our audience, why don't you tell them? Just give them thirty seconds on who you are. Um, I'm excited about this because I think so many of our fans and our audience have questions for venture capitalists for VCs. So I want to just sort of have you put into your own words what you do, and then we'll sort of get into the meat of it. Yeah. So you know, just quick summary. I I work in venture capital. I work for a a large Japanese uh, company that's uh, investing in the U.S. currently. Um, You know, so my job is literally meeting entrepreneurs and investing and supporting them. Uh, What's the name of the fund? uh, It's the AET fund, which actually stands for the Akatsuki Entertainment Technology Fund. So we, you know, has an acronym because it's hard to, uh, it's hard to pronounce here in the U.S. Um, but the fund is uh, backed by Akatsuki, which is the, I think, the second largest mobile gaming developer in Japan. Um, yeah, so you know, we're looking to get into things like consumer entertainment, entertainment tech. Can, can you confirm the Japanese VCs are smarter than everybody else? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Japanese, though, but uh, yeah, they're quite smart, I would say. Uh, the, I think the culture is, is like, you know, since working here, it's been really interesting to experience, and they're super detail-oriented and, uh, you know, big thinkers and, um, and really respectful. It's just a different, a different vibe. Yeah, that's so, that's so cool, and it it, it seems like uh, everywhere around the world we're starting to see these major trends. And as a VC, uh, it just seems like you're on top of everything right now. That's what I like about you. I mean, I guess I should preface by saying I have had sort of a geek crush on Mark for a su- <laughs> for a super long time. Uh, I think we've been hanging, chopping it up for what like four or five years, isn't it? Or three, yeah, four or five years, something like that at this point. And when I have questions about technology, I generally turn to Mark um, to get analysis. And uh, so I'm glad you're here today. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. I I would say to the audience, I also turn to you when I have questions around stuff too. So it goes goes both ways. We're like the geek brothers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so Mark, why don't, why don't you tell us, give us a little bit about your background and, and where you come from and how did you end up as a VC, Mark, how did you, like, how did you, everyone wants to be a VC these days. How did Mark Lanau end up as a VC? You're young, man. You're like, how old are you? I just turned 36, actually. Oh, I just, man, I just, you know, you, that's I young. Just look, I just look young. <laughs> See, that, that is young. So how did you end up, how did you end up as a VC? Um, I think everyone says this, but it's, I think it's true. I haven't experienced it. I got lucky. Um, I had always wanted yeah, I used to be an, an engineer. I used to work in aerospace engineering. Um, and then I left uh, when I found out I got into business school to go work at a startup for like eight bucks an hour. And I was literally, you know, getting paid just gas money. Um, Did you feel like you were like more geeky or more business shark? My my teachers in at, at school, in engineering school, thought I was more businessy and, you know, I like doing the presentations and, and doing the PowerPoint stuff and selling the features of an, of a cool technology versus, versus how I arrived there. So, um, or how we arrived there. So I think I'm 
yeah, more cater towards the, like the businessy side. And, you know, I think I learned that early on uh, during my undergrad years. But literally, you know, to your question, how, how I got into VC, I, I, I had because I had a background in engineering and going to a startup that ended up going public. The uh, um, my boss at the time reached out to me like cold on LinkedIn was like, do you want to consult for our fund that we're spinning up? And then, you know, I had accepted an offer from Amazon to actually go back there after my internship. What year was this? This is like 2013. Yeah, like 2013. So 2013, you're about to go work at Amazon. Yeah. And you just get this out of the blue VC call. Yeah, and that's exactly... They were, he, and the only thing we had in common was it's lucky because what I did is I finished school early, I finished my MBA early, and I came out here to literally see my parents hang out with my friends and go to Coachella because I wasn't going to... I finished all my classes so early that I was just waiting for my friends to graduate. You're basically going out to get wasted <laughs> at Coachella. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It was a good lineup. Um, and then... I changed my, I luckily just changed my um, my location because I, I went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. So that was my, my location on LinkedIn. And I when I came to LA, I, I changed it back to Los Angeles and someone pinged me. It's like, hey, you're in LA. Do you want to consult for our, for our fund? And I was like, yeah, but I'm going back to Amazon after. And like, that's totally cool. We'll just keep you till you graduate or till you officially graduate and you can work for us since you're not in classes. Um, I think I did a good enough, good enough job to stay on and I, you know, kind of turned down Amazon at the end, like last minute and I, all my boxes were labeled Seattle and stuff. I um, bet Bezos was, was like crying. Yeah. Yeah. Bezos <laughs> was like, no, we lost Linnell. <laughs> well, yeah, seriously, I wish. Um, but I did, I did do a lot of work there. Um, that's being used today. But yeah, I wait. So, are you saying that you were in Michigan and then you came out to LA on sort of a lark? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm from LA, but I um, I went to Michigan for business school, and that's what brought me back here was a job in VC. I mean, my plan was to I was gonna go to business school, gonna go work at Amazon uh, after I finished business school. But then this came in, and then I was like, I love this job. I'm staying, and and they like me, and they love me, so. I get to stay here. I get to go to Coachella without having to fly on a plane. I get to be around. You know, my my parents live literally like three, like uh, around like two miles away from here. Um, we'll, from, have to, we'll have to have your parents over to the Chance Bending Studios. <laughs> exactly, family edition. But yeah, uh, so like I think I got really lucky, like super lucky, because uh, it's because it's a hard gig to get there's not a lot of funds and, and capital out here especially in los angeles right well that's why i ask is that this podcast is called chance bending because we're we're trying to break down how people bend chance and it's really our belief that people put themselves in a position for these good things to happen right so it sounds like you you did the right things to sort of get lucky yeah, mm-hmm. totally. That, that's so funny. I never knew that's what it stood for. Chance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, it, that's the direction we're going, right? Cool, man. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Uh, yeah, that's, ex- and it, it's interesting because I always had in the back of, the, of my mind, like I, I actually took this weird personality test, like in, in business school. And one of the jobs was like venture capitalist. And I was like, oh, I thought after business school, I'd just be a product manager or a, uh, uh, brand uh, brand manager or whatnot um going to consulting like you know the you Bain, thought only McKenzie. wealthy only wealthy white guys <laughs> do vc wait what a minute yeah yeah exactly and and um so i yeah i just always feel super fortunate um and grateful i mean i have a i, I write in this like five minute journal do you know about that oh tell us more it's like three it's like it's a gratitude journal basically and it's like you fill in the blanks. It's like name three things you're grateful for. Um, it has like a you know like a really inspirational quote at the top of the book, and you do it every day. Um, How long have you been doing this? Uh, it's it's been like, I think it's been seven or eight months straight. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What's happening? Are things happening? I think so. I think it's. I, I think I'm seeing more luck come into my life. More uh, chance betting. Yeah, more chance bending. Um, definitely more. I think I 
am cognizant of, you know, like when you lose something and then you end up finding it, you're like, oh, I'm so glad I had this. You, it, it kind of like instills that in me. I'm always like, I don't have to lose something. I'm like always glad I have it. I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I have like running water. Like you can be thankful for stuff like that, which is like, which, you know, some people don't even have like running, drinking clean water. Um, so I think it's good because, you know, I, I feel very fortunate and lucky, but I think it's like being grateful brings more into my life. I mean, I'm getting super spiritual here, by the way, but man, you're yeah. just dropping spirituality. <laughs> yeah. But, We're you know, oming now. but you know, like, but practically speaking, spe- uh, speaking about, you know, talking about venture capital, it's like, um, it's a pretty your job is in, in a way to like go sell money to entrepreneurs right and and i like my job is to try to meet all these great investors entrepreneurs operators um people who can connect me to who i could be investing in in the future and it's like there's it's there's like things like angel lists which i'm not sure if the audience knows about but it's a a platform where you can go and invest in in startups but sometimes you know that's not how it still really is in the industry people invest in people they know and in their network and it's a lot of it's like by chance and just who you know um and and if they know you and like people sometimes reach out to me now um but yeah so it's like i almost feel like uh, this gratitude journal kind of makes you attract and recognize like abundance in your life which i think i you know, um, and now that I'm older, I'm like, I'm realizing it sounds like really hocus pocus, but it's, it's like not. No. And, and, you know? and what I'm hearing you say, which I think is really cool, is that VC is in essence a relationship game and it's a network game and a network and relationship game requires goodwill and gratitude because you're, you're basically hoping that network effect, like gives you positive network brings you all of these new opportunities so it might be hard to to quantify yeah but like that's a very important piece of what you're doing here yeah definitely i mean my job is literally to go out and i go to these networking events to go hopefully meet someone that or meet someone who would you know introduce me to that the next company i would be investing in and you know it's for me, I had to stay top of mind to people like, oh, yeah, I'm out there, you know, um, investing and in, representing a, a Japanese fund right now and looking at the future of entertainment and things like that. So, 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 yeah, uh, uh, this job is really serendipitous. Uh, I think most sense. people would think of it the other way around, right? Traditionally, they think of uh, founders, startups, they're, they're desperate to talk to VCs. And what I'm hearing you say is, no, it's actually the other way around as well, is that you're trying to put your best foot forward to meet founders. And that's an important piece of this of this puzzle. It's not as easy as you may think. Yeah, hundred percent. It's I don't like sit there and like just like screen, you know, and all these companies come my way and know how to reach me and things like or know about me or who or who we are, um, you know, and like what we're looking for. It's I have to be out there and, and kind of hustling, you know? Um and you know the you know the more I do that, the more I provide you know the opportunity or the, the higher chance or probability I have of meeting people I want to invest in. And yeah, yeah. So. so so let's get into it. Let's let's give the audience what they want. What do you look for when you are looking for great founders and great startups? Like what pops out at you? I I like well I. Because the job requires me to to work with the person um, I'm, we're and you know that we're investing in or the or the company we're investing in that he that he's the founder of I like good entrepreneurs and that could mean a num- the good means a number of things like have they have they done it before is 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 um is a good indicator for me are they that's really- your first question have have they done it before well have they are are they are they entrepreneurial? Like, does their, their past, like I asked them about their story, like how, over coffee, like how they are. I want to ask them about a person. Like, are are they a sincere human being? Are they not scamming me or playing me in any in any way? Because they're we're writing quite large 
checks to, to these companies. So I want to, I guess the first thing that I look at personally is like, is this guy like scamming me or not? <laughs> to be honest, yeah. Is this founder a criminal? Yeah. yeah, is this person is this person like really like worth his salt? Um has does his background, does his education, does his does what what he's done and his interests in, in life, does does it line up in in a, in any way to to what he's pitching me on? To me that's important. So I, I think we call that like founder market fit. Um and then on the on the other side of things, like we look at certain we look at certain metrics, but I would say like recently, uh, I don't know how much traction you really need to to garner investment from from top tier VCs. Like like you Dude, said, tell us more. This is juicy. Yeah, well, I think it's because I mean, talking about the market going on here, there's just so a lot of capital in the system right now that people what used to require like some level of traction, whether it's you're making $25,000 per month or you're making, you know, two to $5 million a year to raise like a series A, um, for example. I'm seeing things happen now where because there's so much capital in the system, founders actually have more leverage and they can raise a huge round. Um, I'm not gonna say which company it is, but I've seen, I recently saw, heard of a company that raises huge round and like, no product in market and it's and the implied valuation of that round is like a hundred million dollars or something like that something that may be less a little less than a hundred million dollars but it's crazy right there's like there's like no so that could ha- that happens well, right why don't you break it down for our audience if if you will uh so the first round of capital is generally called the seed round yeah it well it's called the seed but because of so much it's changing it's crazy so it's generally called the seed round and that's like you know the first, that's usually the first amount of outside capital that you take into your company. And, you know, that's where you experience, you know, other people that could, you know, your your investors could change, could really change the direction of where you're going with, with your business. And it's also where you kind of dilute yourself down as an owner. Um, but that's typically called the seed round, right? But now there's like this new class, like called pre-seed. I'm not sure if you, you probably heard of it, right? Yeah. And and that's happening because there's because VCs are now um, you know they're they're kind of ex, they're kind of expecting more traction at seed, which is actually looking more like an A round, which means you've already have products and and market fit, and you're you're doing revenue, or you've got like engaged users. You've got like what is that? I saw some comp like twenty five to. 25,000 to a million daily active users of your consumer app or whatnot. All right. So, so let's break it down again. Yeah. There is, we, maybe let's start out first. There's pre seed, pre seed, no metrics or small met, number yeah, of like, metrics. That's like the startup, it's basically an idea and you're attracting people who believe in the idea and founder. Yeah. Is that fair? Yep. Yep. All right. The next round, the seed round. That seed. Right, the seed round used to be like an A round, but now it's everything shifted. Yep. The seed round. What are m- typical metrics you might look for for a B two B and a B two C? Um, for B two C, I've heard um, anywhere from a million dollars in revenue for a C, or like five hundred, or sorry, like two hundred fifty k to a million dollars in revenue for B two B. Uh. I have to. I have to look. You know what? I actually, I think I have. Some, I wrote some stuff down. Um, yeah. So for B two B, let's call it SaaS, ten thousand dollars to fifty thousand dollars per month, like recurring revenue. That's that's so software you, as a service. If you have yeah. ten to fifty thousand per month in reoccurring revenue, you, you're really at the seed level. Seed. Yep. Got it. Yeah. All right. That's B two B. Now for B two C. For B two C, so there's like two types of b2c there's um you could be selling like product like an e-commerce company right so i wrote i wrote down or what i've seen in market is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to a million dollars in revenue and that's like you're selling this consumer product like and that's for seed right for like an an app or like yeah, a like a consumer, social like, yeah like that's a social network and they look at daily active usage so that's that's 25 to 25,000 to 50 
like 50 to 60,000 um, people daily, per day per day yeah and that's like seed but I've, I've honestly but it's but these are like i know these are all rough these are rough and these are actually uh numbers where like a vc if a vc saw this they'd be like oh this is definitely like a winner like these are like high end these are like more at the top, yeah. the top this yeah. is to, to make sure you get a deal done yeah exactly like if you're there then the chances of you getting an investor to come in are, are, are quite high in my opinion, yeah, um, but you, I've definitely there's a definitely times where this is broken rule. Like we we invested in in a company that I think at the time was doing only a thousand daily active users or something like that, and it was a seed, right? It was a seed deal. It wasn't twenty five thousand daily actives. So and and can you give us a general reason for that? The reason why I want our audience to understand that their basic benchmarks. But then there's always exceptions to the rule and that your job as a VC is to basically spot when you make the exception to the rule. Yeah. And this is like the exception, which is which is more qualitative. I, I think the founder has the founder returned capital for his previous investors on his last startup. The founder is has a, a really like a founder has a really great ability to hire and it's just it's just a, a leader. He instills like a great culture with his team, and I and I see that. Um, I you know, part of the diligence that we do is like I'll look at who know who else knows you, and I will call them. I'll be I'll like cold email this person who's like connected to you, to you on LinkedIn, and ask them about you, with like without you knowing that, <laughs> you know. So that's what you VCs are doing. <laughs> yeah, we're we're like you know we're. Um, we're like detectives. We have, to, I mean, there's no, we have to like get every piece of data that we can and tr to try to make a decision. Um, but like, for example, like this, I think I would say like one of the founders in particular kind of breaks these rules for me because they return capital, they sold, they've done it before, like I said. Like that's to me, that's that, to me, that's kind of, that's pretty high on my list. Um, they are, they're, they're good leaders, they instill a good culture. He's a, his ability to hire, because, in retrospect, when you think about it, the most of the value is in the team at that at these stages, at these early stages right. that we invest in, and his ability to hire people away from big set, big you know big jobs with big paychecks to work for equity means like you know this is like a for real team. That's interesting. So you're measuring the CEO and the founder based on how well they recruit other talented individuals for basically no money. And then they put together an accomplished group of people, and that's a huge component. Totally, yeah. To, to this, it's a huge component, and and that's probably the reason why some of these deals that I've I've been seeing, like they, um, they haven't released a product yet. But maybe what I don't know about this uh, these deals is like I don't know how great and and how how great their team is. I don't know like all the things I described. Like maybe they check every 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 box of a great founder and they and they pulled the, these investors heartstrings and they have to like invest in this because like this market's huge and this this is the founder and the team to do it you know um so yeah so give us an example of uh, one of your portfolio companies or one of your companies you invested in and just walk us through briefly like how that like wow. give us the love story how like how put it together ah uh, such a good question I, I, let's see which one i'm allowed to talk about um yeah, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll I'll talk about. So, okay, I think I could talk about this. So, we invested in this company called um, called Ripcord, and if you've played HQ trivia, it's 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 kind of leveraging that. It's like live a live game show, and you get to interact with it. But what's different about this for me is that you know the um, he's creating interesting formats of the game and also ways that you could play the game without them being live. Like that's like the vision. So it's like, it's essentially a game show network, not just one game. Um, this founder- It's a live game show network yeah. that doesn't always have to be live. It's asynchronous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you get, you get the choice, but it's, the, I guess to me, the more interesting piece is a live piece, but- What's interesting to me is that this is a game show network that lives 
in a mobile phone in the mobile era, right? Um, this person has been able to hire amazing teams or an amazing team uh, away from from what they were doing. He's he instills a great culture. Um, he's returned capital for his previous investors and his uh, at his previous company, and we we really vibe like we like he he tech we're like on a text basis you know we um i don't feel like i need to go through his assistant and or i don't even think he has one to be honest like i don't need to do that to talk to him and he asked me questions about all types of stuff and i asked him questions about all types of stuff too and so it's like a and it's he's like really knowledgeable in certain spaces and he has that network i think to build a great entertainment and media company. Um, and so I was like, this is like a no brainer for me. I know it like seems like counterintuitive that there's so much noise in the space and so many other apps that are out there, but uh, he could execute on this. And the, uh, to me, his execution abilities from his past are like, you know, it says a lot about what, what he could do with this, with this venture. Yeah. So it's, it's so it sounds like the founder is so important. Yeah, and, and and there are so many different pieces of that: their leadership, their ability to recruit, their talent. What's interesting to me is you haven't really talked a lot about the space. Whereas I think most people would say, "Oh, is this is this idea or is, is this space what what you want?" And I'm not hearing any of that. Well, no, a teeny bit of that. Yeah. Well, it's because I don't know. It's because we didn't like type, quite get into it. But yeah. But I I just the spaces I'm looking at. I'm looking at entertainment and media and gaming and the future of gaming, uh, still looking at virtual reality, augmented reality and things like that. And um, VR is where uh, Mark and I met actually. We, yeah. we were both doing a lot of VR deals and- Looking at um, stuff. Looking at stuff and it was like, what year, again, that was probably 2014 or something. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, 15? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, it was exciting. Uh, and then not a lot happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's funny. I actually, we actually invested in a VR deal. Out of, I think, I'm not sure if I told you this, but we did a VR deal and it was actually a hard deal to get into. I had, I had to chase that one. When, when was this? This was like a few months ago. Really? Yeah. Really? That's a bullish sign on VR. Yeah, well, it's different though because it's like, you know, just kind of as an aside. Can you, name the, can you name the company or not yet? Not yet, but what they're, what they're doing is they are addressing chronic pain using VR and it's because I learned all this stuff that um, from actually a chronic pain doctor um, who owns a few hospitals who, or practices who told me about this but VR is actually a good solution to rewire your brain to think that your that certain parts of your body are not in pain and what it and the way they do that typically is they they use a a, uh, a mirror box method I think that's what it's called. So basically, if you're putting one hand out, you put your head in this mirror and you put the hand that doesn't hurt, but it looks like the hand that does hurt is moving. And it's actually training your brain not to experience pain from what you see because tra because pain is apparently more of a neurological issue than an, an anatomical. Uh, and Interesting. So then once you've done that, it can apply actually to the real world once you're walking exactly around. yeah exactly like you've trained your body to to not see it that way yeah and 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 I, from what from you know i, may, I could be i i talked to a few doctors so maybe i'm not the expert here but they're saying like yeah you can say like you have a this disc in your back is 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 totally fine but you still you can still experience pain there so sometimes they they tell patients to go to go talk to like like a psychologist, right? Right. Yeah, and then so what? What's what the the link here? Why we did is because they're using like VR game development chops to like, and as an application to to chronic pain treatment, which is super interesting to me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's wild. Yeah. So so <laughs> so for 2019, um, it sounds like you have you have a heavy focus in media, entertainment, gaming. What's coming down the pipe? What are you excited about? Are, are there any big trends you're looking at right now? Yeah, uh, this is like one of my favorite questions, actually, because I, because like I'm right now in the middle of thinking about what is going on in 2019. Um, I, I'm a, I'm pretty bullish on post Facebook era communities, 
If that makes any that sense. That does. That does. So so you're you're like, man, Facebook is over. <laughs> no, I, I think groups is sticky. Groups is oh, Facebook groups are sticky. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Shout out to my voice entrepreneur group. Uh, I love all of you guys, and it is sticky. We have a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, but I think um, you know, at least for some of the audience that that isn't that that isn't on Facebook, and I think I I just I'm just seeing a lot of interesting affinity groups form around different things and. Where are they? Where are they congregating? How how do you see that activity playing out right now? Uh, I'm seeing, I'm actually seeing it um, physically happen, uh, and I, the most, the most recent, I guess, evidence of this is there's a company called the Riveter, and there's also a company called the Wing, which is basically like a a, a women's network, like a but like a WeWork, but for women. I think WeWork invested in one of those companies too, but it's. It's like Soho House, right? But just for, you know, uh, female entrepreneurs and, and, and things like Got that. It. So it's an offline, real world, physical location group where people get together of certain affinities, certain yeah, yeah, certain interests. Yeah. So I think there's like there's got to be an opportunity around interesting special like interest groups and and um, you know, if you think about next door. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I, it's weird. If you, when I became a homeowner, finally, I felt like I had to download that for some reason. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but it's yeah, but think about like next door, and um, it's that's a com- that's an online community of like just your zip code and your and your your area, right? So, right. so I think maybe because of all the stuff that's going on on Facebook right now, and and also like I don't I don't know if you know about this, but I know there's an article right uh, that. These kids are making like party invites over Instagram. They're making an Instagram account. And what they do is they're like, you're only invited to the party. You have to request that account. And if you're invited, like it's a private account. If you're invited, they will they will like let you into that account. And like that account's like about the party. It's like an event bright, but on but on Instagram. So, so that, weird. That's cool. That's yeah, really cool. Which makes me think like there's gotta be like a need. Um for something like with a different UI or UX than than than, than Eventbrite, like this is like a small community. Yeah. I was here. I was recently accepted to a highly selective NBA basketball WhatsApp group, <laughs> which took me a while to uh, to gain acceptance. And then it was like I felt like I was being tested when I was like posting. Yeah, um, so, so, funny. so it's one of my big accomplishments for 2018. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, see, exactly. So you're already experiencing it, and and uh, um, the other thing is is avatars. Um, I think I've been seeing a lot of activity in in the avatar space, um, and I'm sure you've heard of like this little Michaela digital influencer thing. There's like two things of avatars when I when I talk about this. I think there's like fake people, like digitally CGI, basically celebrities on Instagram. That have like millions of followers. Have you? Yeah, oh yeah. 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 So there's that. They're my favorite. <laughs> and then there's um, there's like, I've seen like, communities organize and like the way these kids represent themselves is like via avatars and like they walk around and talk to each other and it's, it's I mean some things I've seen they kind of troll each other right now but these are kids that know each other in real life but they're like interacting like in a video game. Um, I think there's an article that talks about how Fortnite kids will like meet up in Fortnite. Like that's how they, that's how they interact with their, their friends, you know, like. Yeah. I've, I've heard about this, right? Like neighborhood kids are getting together in Fortnite instead of getting together in real life. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. so wild, but like, you know, there's like a lot of, and that's what I mean by avatars. Like there's something, there's something that like represents you, but that's like not you, but digitally, you know? Um, and you get to interact with other people like, with their avatars. It's just, and it's crazy, man. It just reminds me of like, I'm probably, yeah, I mean, I already told you how old I was, but I used to use like, you know, go in those private rooms or whatever and like on, on AOL Instant Messenger. Yeah. Or on AOL. It's like, it's like that, but like you're controlling like a, an avatar instead. So. Yeah. So, so is your experience in Fortnite, like they're not even really playing the game. They're more like hanging out and talking or is there like a little game playing or like how, I think how there's are like tracking? There's there's game playing for sure, but they're like but the reason why they go there is just to connect with other, with other people. Mm. Like like what you would do like in real life, you know? Um 
Yeah, that was wild, man. That's, and and <laughs> so, so do you find that does your fund? Are you guys looking? Uh, you know, it's it's always thought here in the United States that China and Japan are leading the way with so many different ideas like this, like avatars and so forth. Do you guys look for trends in Japan or China and then try and, and find them in the United States? Is that part of your fund strategy or is that not really it, what you're doing? I think it's that is part of it because uh, we're actually looking at India and we've made a few investments. I don't manage those investments, but um, they look to see what's going on like in China or the U.S. and what's happening because some of that actually crosses over to India. Um so so yeah, I think it's called time travel, like or something like that. It's yeah, uh, sure. But yeah, we we are looking at, at that. But then I would say, like in in the U.S., um, for example, like live, um, like QVC, like for millennials, like shop that 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 already happens like in a big way in in China, right? Right. Hasn't happened like yet quite here. So. No, I mean in. in when I was a VC and investor and, and just for the last 10 years, I can't tell you how many times that got pushed in front of my desk. Like, okay, here's the new QVC, you know, for millennials. And it, and, you know, I've seen a million of these variations and it just has not worked over and over and over again. Yeah. And I, and like, I'm, I don't know, I'm hopeful that it, that'll work. Uh, you know, I think live is like a really interesting space to, to, to look at. We, we were part of um, the most recent BetaWorks live camp, and they had a few, a few companies in there that are, or all the companies in there were, are doing something that's related to, to live, to live streaming or live entertainment. Um, like there's a really interesting one called Journey Meditation, where um, it's, you're in a live class with like a live instructor who's teaching you to to meditate. You know? Yeah. 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 So it's a lot of that going on. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's interesting. But I'm yeah. I'm actually bullish. I, I sort of think that with voice, there's going to be sort of like QVC stuff going on. Um, I haven't seen a lot of it yet. I really thought when I first got into voice that I'd see a lot of it with different like auction, like, like live auction experiences and so forth. And we just haven't seen it, which is really strange to me. Yeah. 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 I agree. But yeah, there's a lot of just like interesting stuff going on in it, and that's what makes the job super exciting. Because I'm like, I'm like always like looking at these like nascent communities or nascent like trends happening, and I'm like, are these going to happen in a big way or or not? And and how do I get in on that like before it gets like too big, you know? Yeah, yeah. So when when someone someone in my audience is listening right now, they're like, man, I cannot wait. I want to get in touch with Mark Lanau. I'm gonna pitch. Mark Lanau. <laughs> I'm going to get the Japanese money, <laughs> right? Um, what are the things they should not do? Like, what are the obvious things that like rookie, you know, founders and startup people do that like automatically crosses them off the list? I have a few. If you if if you're struggling, uh, that, that's a good question. I, I've seen like it's always good to get, I guess, a referral um, from some like. Chances are, if you find me on LinkedIn, you probably know someone who knows me. Um, so that's a good way. But things that not to do, I've seen a lot of spamming of pitch decks, and it's like a non. It's like a. It's like an email that literally looks like a marketing email that's been sent to a thousand other people. Don't do that. It's obvious. Do not spam your pitch deck. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy, but. I get you get a few every I get a few every week and it's like I get a few every week. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like why if it's not personal like that it that sucks. I I feel like I'm just you know, it's like why are you even they're just like it, what it shows it shows like desperation and it shows that you're not being thoughtful about how you're you're not going through the correct communication channels and things like that to to get to an investor. Um because I ideally you want to pitch, you know, you want to pitch a VC because you know that it's 
that this is a, a potential fit. For yeah, the like raising VC is about establishing a partnership. Mm -hmm. It's not about selling like your soul and and your credibility and desperation to like sell and get money. It, it, it has nothing to do with that. It's more it's like a strategic alliance. Definitely, I definitely it's a it's a partnership, and the money comes with some. With a, with a lot of strings attached, actually, right? A ton of strings attached. It's <laughs> yeah, like the so, worst thing you can do, no yeah, offense. Yeah, that's why I'm sometimes, I'm like, uh, I'm like, if I were you, I wouldn't, I'll, I'll tell a founder, like, I was like, if you could think you can do this on your own without raising money, then you should probably delay the VC thing. Describe some of these strings for, for our audience, if you can. Um, well, like, if, 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 let's say, technically, if you're, if there's, if you have enough ownership, you can, change the direction of where the company is going. You can, I think, you know, I, I haven't been on a board yet, but from what I understand, you could fire the CEO if, right? Yeah, yeah. You, I, you I think get there's yourself like, in that situation. I always tell people, I don't even like owing someone a slice of pizza. <laughs> so if I'm taking a million dollars or multi-million dollars, like that's a really big deal. That is a serious thing you're doing. And there is an expectation there, when someone gives you that much money, it's a lot more than a slice of pizza. They're they're asking you for basically to dedicate your life. And if things don't work out like you describe, the investors can change the rules, they can change the people, mm -hmm. they can change the expectations, they can change your life. So if you're going to go raise, just know and take that really, really seriously. Yeah, and that's great advice, see? Um... There's, there's definitely, you know, you, you, you owe, because you're, you know, you're taking someone else's money. There's a lot of things you have to do. Like you have to give updates on what's going on in your business, especially if, if they have the rights to the information rights, you know, you have to give quarterly updates. You, you need to report, you know, you need to report to your to your board if they're on your board, like what's going on. The the comp the, bo the board director knows what's going on in your company, and and can and can change change how things turn out for you. Um, you know, s some investors are are high maintenance. They're going to be sending you emails, texting you, calling you. Maybe how are you getting anything? You know, done if 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 you're if you're in a part if you're uh, you know partnered with an investor like that. It's, you know, it, sometimes we could be a nuisance, like, because we don't know what's, you know, we're, we're like, because we have a job to, to, to let our investors as venture capitalists know what's going on with our portfolio too. So yeah, it just goes down, it just goes downhill. Like a that, lot of you know? responsibility. Yeah. Lots of responsibility for sure. JD, are you still there by any chance? <laughs> Did we just leave you totally out? And are you just? No, I'm, I'm here. I'm here learning a lot. I'm just in the middle of you hear all this commotion I'm in front of right now. I I can. It sounds like you have a serious hoops game going on. Yeah, man. You know, we're just getting warmed up, really. Too. Give us the, the scene. Yeah, stuff. what's going on? Give us the scene over there. <laughs> man, we up here at Beverly Hills High School. Everybody getting stressed out, warmed up. Uh, their high school team is actually finishing up practice, so we just chilling, taking in. Taking in this great, useful Beverly Hills basketball going on right now, man. He's getting getting ready to calm before the storm. Yeah, I hope no one no one laugh at Beverly Hills basketball. It's serious over there. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I like it. It's good vibes over here. There's nothing to love. <laughs> Do you uh, have you heard any of this of our conversation with Mark? Man, I got so many questions. I I just, I just didn't want to interrupt the flow. Y'all y'all got in a great flow. I, I didn't want to interrupt it, but yeah, I mean, uh, first thing first, the thing you most recently said about the avatar business, um, that's something that I've been hearing a lot about lately. Um, I think it's a company called Genies or something like that? Yeah, Genies. Yeah, I know a few of the investors in that company. Yeah. So, so I mean, that would probably fall under that category, and I know they've been trying to get involved with shit. I actually had a conversation with them about doing some stuff with some guys, so I, I can definitely relate to that and see how that could be big, which is crazy to me because I really didn't understand it at first. Like, yeah, people, I guess people are really in it. Into, and even like the genies on your phone, you know, I always get messages from somebody as a dog avatar talking <laughs> to me nowadays or something like that. 
JD, are you saying that you're you're potentially working out NBA player genies? Uh, I mean, nothing is imminent right now. We had a loose conversation about it, but now that you know, I heard from an expert that that's a thing. That's something I might have to take more serious. See, I love it. I love it. You are you are working the insides right now. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. There's a there's a app from China called Zepetto, and I think. It was like like a few weekends ago. It was like the most downloaded app in China. Zepeto. Um, yeah, Z E P E T O. And I'm 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 on it, and I like have an avatar. You take a picture of yourself, and then it generates your avatar. And I'm like sitting there, like buying clothes for myself on there, like with the the free coins they gave me. And I'm spending time, like I'm really shopping for clothes. I'm like, oh, I want this like thing that kind of looks like a Supreme hoodie. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I want these dope sneakers, like. Uh, and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> but I'm in there, and I'm like, you know, I'm spending fake money, but still, it's I, I, I can kind of get it, yeah. So, so they really are ahead of us. In some, yeah, in some yeah. cases, they are for sure. Like this, this one in, in particular is pretty cool because if you have friends, you can, I could like take pictures with them, and they'll put they'll mash our our avatars together in these funny poses. And if I have, if I have a friend. In 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 Zepetto, they'll they'll let me do that, and it's and I get to post it on my social media, and it's like, oh, cool, you know. If I check out Zepetto, is is there enough English, or is there no? Yeah, English? yeah it's, it's totally English. Totally yeah. English. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm good. I know my Friday night. <laughs> I know my holiday season. Kids are gonna go to bed. I'm gonna be like, hey, honey, I'm actually gonna be playing Zepetto. <laughs> so I, I got a I got a I got a quick question for y'all. Though. Like, can y'all educate me on like? What is the monetization behind a business like that? Like, what is the upside of investing into a genie's or um, the company you just mentioned based out of China? Like, where where does the money come from? Yeah, it's a good question because you're like, what is it, right? It's um, I think it comes for the most part, and at least from what I my experience is like in app purchases. So like what I was talking about, like I'll, I'll go shopping for stuff and I'll eventually run out of money. So I have to pay real money to get money in game currency to go buy stuff to make my avatar look cool. And, you know, it's just kind of like real life in a way. You're like, oh, I gotta up my social status. So I have to I gotta buy this next this new this new uh t shirt that dropped in the game. And it's a fake shirt, but I'm gonna pay for it. And that's how they they, they um that's how they monetize. And there's probably like unlocking to new games and new rooms you could you could use your avatar in. I don't know. What have you seen, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I um, one of my old investors, who's one of my favorite people in the world. His name is Howard Lindzen, and I was talking to him about. Oh, yeah. uh, you know Howard? Yeah, 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 yeah. great guy. Uh, he was talking about gifts, and when gifts came out, or gifts or gifts or whatever, like uh, a while ago, I'm like, Howard, how is this stuff going to make money? He's like, I don't care. He's like, as long as it gets enough attention, enough eyeballs, we'll figure it out. Well, because he, he, I think he invested in Giphy. Oh, really? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was like, "Yeah, we're gonna figure it out." So I think to a certain extent that happens. But to your point, um, I think most people don't realize like there's this game I'm sort of addicted to called World Series of Poker. It's a hold'em poker app. Mm-hmm. Uh, the company makes uh, like billions. Literally, that that industry makes billions of dollars a year. And guess what? You're not gambling real money. You, it, so when you go into the poker app, you are playing with their like funny money. You cannot win real money, yet people spend billions of dollars a year in their currency to continue to play the game, which is crazy to me. You're telling me that you've convinced people to spend money on fake hold'em poker. So to your point, um, you know, I think that these in-app purchases, if there's enough steam, if there's enough eyeballs, if there's enough momentum, people spend money. Yeah. You know? Yeah. JD, does that does that help? Yeah, no, it sounds like, you know, uh, in layman's terms, people are paying to satisfy their competitive craving. Just, just, just the thought of, like, reaching the next level or beating somebody in poker. Like, you know, people are just satisfying their competitive uh, nerves. Yeah, there's a status, right? It's, it's all about the status. Yeah. All right. I I know in Fortnite teams um, put their skins and you can go buy like you can go buy like a skin from a t- certain team on Fortnite like you know or from like a are those selling? 
I don't know. I, th- I think so. I gotta, I gotta go look. Yeah, but I know, I know, you, c- I know that there's a marketplace to buy stuff like that now, though. I mean, besides buying, I don't know, like other, like, other items, but it's just like to make your character like look cool. You know, just oh, I got this cool hat. It's like I don't know. I played. Um, gosh, I'm gonna like show how much of a nerd I am. Uh, I pro- I played World of Warcraft. Did you play that game or like oh, a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I and I was like buying, you know, I was like buying gold in the game to go buy like cool weapons and and those are functional, like it'd make me a better player and and make me strong and stuff and but I would also I was also buying stuff that had just to like look cool. I remember that. I'm pretty sure it's that or EverQuest, but yeah, I'm like it's like real life, you know. It's like I'm buying clothes for myself to look cool. <laughs> So. Uh, you have to have a serious conversation with yourself sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Uh, JD, any other questions? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to dive into, obviously, my world when it relates to uh, Mark's world. Because, well, Mark and you guys' world. We talk about this often, then, but um, just the mass-up and the collaboration that's going on, I mean, Mark, I would assume that you pay attention to everything going up on, uh, going up, going on up in Silicon Valley as it relates to the Warriors and it's even Dollar and KD and those guys wanting to get into VC. You got LeBron who basically is a VC himself with his empire. Like, yeah. how do you view the culture of all of that shaping it? Um, I haven't really thought much about it. I think it's, I think it's interesting that you know that, you know, I guess sports players are investing and. In, in companies now i think it's a uh, to me it makes sense like you you see it here in hollywood where some some actors are also investing in, in startups right like i think leonardo dicaprio invested in a lot of different start consumer dicaprio is all over the place yeah yeah no it, um i i i think it's cool and and you know um it gives a little bit of a I guess a little bit of a clout to the startup that receives uh, their money, so it's a little bit of a halo effect. And if that athlete is like really passionate, like I know Kobe is investing, right? Like where his fund is investing out here, and if they can open doors for these founders, and that's like one thing too. I think speaking about our earlier uh, conversation on what we look for, um. People, like athletes and because of their network and, and their experiences and who they know, they can definitely open new doors and opportunities for the companies they invest in. So they can put their money, you know, be a real value added partner to, to these, to these startups. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's interesting. I'm, I think we're going to see more of it. We are continuing to see more of it. And yeah, that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was another thing that I noticed earlier in the conversation. Um, how you touched on what you were talking about earlier when it comes to uh, how you guys do VCs and what you look for. I could definitely relate to that from the um, athletic standpoint because I was just um, having a mini GM mindset. You're always trying to identify like qualities of a coach. Like, if you relate to players, what type of. Um, what type of chemistry and what type of camaraderie does he foster in his culture? And then, obviously, that trickles down to the players. Like, what type mm-hmm. of leader is this guy going to lead my team? So, I think there's definitely a lot of similarities in both worlds that, it's, you know, of course, the product has to fit. Like, a guy has to have an incredible jump shot, but this guy who might not have an incredible other jump shot his personality is going to spur your team to win on just because you might be a passionate leader. So I definitely relate to what you're saying there. Yeah, you know, I have to say, in spending a lot of time with with Jordan Dumars and and his uh, his dad, uh, Hall of Famer Joe Dumars, I'm, I mean, I always knew this, but now I'm just seeing it so clearly how much culture and culture building matters, right? And and Joe as as an incredible GM. You know, for so long and winning titles and and what he's instilled in Jordan, I mean, it's it's about building that culture. Mm-hmm. And if I'm hearing you correctly, it's it's the same idea with company building. Um, you can have the best ideas in the world, but it really comes down to that team, that founder, and then building that that thing. Yeah, totally. I mean, like like you were saying, um, 
bad culture could cause a team to to you know to break apart and things to fail and that's why that's like all, where all the money's going like in the beginning like with, especially if there's not a real product out there yet right so it's super important it's really important that's cool that's cool well uh i have to say this has been a really really good conversation jordan do you have you have anything else you want to you want to add no that was it man like i said i i was tuned in the whole time i I definitely learned a lot today. Um, a lot of things, man, you have already talked about, but um, just kind of reinforcing what, what, uh, what you've been educating me on when it comes to the similarities. And, you know, great products are great products, and you definitely got to be able to identify them, do the research, make sure the numbers all make sense. But at the end of the day, I think you know, the, the, resounding, the resounding factor is culture. That's that's what was reinforced to me today, and that's what I, uh, what I think people can take away from the VC world. Well, uh, JD, thank you. It sounds like you're in the trenches. You are hardcore in the trenches right now, doing your stuff. It sounds like JD's playing. He's like on AirPods. I, it does sound telling. like it. maybe he is. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I'm on. I'm on AirPods right now. <laughs> I really hope you. I really hope you were dunking while you were talking about <laughs> about culture. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, Mark. Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. We're gonna have to have you back. We do. A, we do a little series called Startup Review where we have startups come in. We review them. You got to come in and work with us on on a couple of them. Yeah, right? are you yeah. into it? Yeah, I'm into it. Yeah, it's 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 sort of Shark Tanky, but we're not like we, you know we, we're we're a little nicer maybe. That's all. <laughs> uh, yeah, awesome. Thank you for cool. having me. Of, of course, man. Well, uh, happy holidays to everyone out there, and uh, we'll be back again soon. We are out. <laughs>